ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're about to start the uh, afternoon session on the role of the media in cross-strait relations. However, before we start the session, uh, Dr. Wood have something to say. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to this session. Um, the news probably some of you have already known. Uh, it has something to do with a very prominent scholar and a great journalist that we have just lost, um, Lucy Chen. Um, she um, was invited to the session first to become a paper presenter and then a discussant. And, um, um, but then later on, um, we were notified that she um, passed away. And for anyone who uh, uh, knows um, the uh, mass media um, in Taiwan, especially the development of journalism, and especially the Shixing uh, Baoxue, uh, Lucy Chen um, is a prominent scholar, a humanitarian, and um, a well-respected uh, journalist in Taiwan. And this thing happened right during the course of our preparation for this conference. So it struck us really, um, 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 give me a very bad feeling because I felt somehow um, we laid an extra burden on her uh, for considering to this conference at a time when she was critically ill. And she was nice enough to tell us that probably her health would not uh, permit her to uh, perform her duty. But nevertheless, she would um, um, invite uh, Professor Huang to this panel. And if possible, she would uh, attend the panel together with Professor Huang. And so she uh, thought very highly on this conference, and she intended to come. And the fact that she couldn't, um, um, it's really um, disappointing. And um, 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 so I have to uh, make this um, announcement before the session began. Um, I think we should all pay great respect to this uh, wonderful scholar and to uh, a great journalist in Taiwan. Um, probably Wen Xin would have something to add to that because I know uh, she's a very uh, good old dear friend to you. Thank you. Um, I uh, know uh, Dr. Chen um, for uh, nearly, oh, well, I wouldn't start counting how many years. I ran into her again uh, when I was a graduate student, and she was on the faculty at uh, UCLA as uh, teaching uh, as in a, um, a um, specializing in the field of uh, Asian American um, uh, social movement. And she was also, for quite some time, the director of the Ethnic Studies uh, Center at uh, UCLA. After that, she returned to uh, Taipei, and uh, she had been serving as the director of a newspaper, Li Bao, at uh, uh, Shixin University. She was, uh, for quite some time, the, uh, the dean of the College of uh, uh, Communications at uh, Shixin University. She was also the editor of Guanji Wenxue, plus uh, the curator of the Cheng Shaowo uh, Memorial Library. So um, she had great plans about the study of um, uh, both of the role of journalism in the study of contemporary societies and uh, the role of um, a history of uh, Republican journalism in facilitating our understanding of um, uh, social changes in uh, uh, contemporary uh, greater China. So it's, uh, I'm delighted to uh, have a chance to share some of her uh, biographical outlines with you. And um, I certainly, uh, um, along with Dr. Wu, feel a great loss uh, from, uh, for all of us of a great scholar. So uh, with that, I suppose uh, we pay our due 
or we offer our respect to the memory of uh, Dr. Lucy Chan. Oh, thank you. I believe the feeling is common among all of us because uh, Dr. Chen is a well-respected scholar and uh, a excellent professional in the world of journalism and mass communications. And I believe her spirits will continue so to guide our younger generations of scholars and professionals in the coming years. And now we begin our uh, afternoon session. Let me first introduce uh, the panels uh, on this session. We have two presenters uh, in this panel. The first one would be Professor Tim Weston. Tim is from University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, he's an associate professor in the Department of History. And his paper is on the shifting official perspectives on the world across the strait which is a comparison of the Central Daily News and the People's Daily since 1978. And I, myself, uh, in addition to my role as the moderator, would also serve as the discussant for this paper. And the number two presenter, uh, Ms. K.F. Lee, uh, she is a very famous uh, professional in the world of advertising, marketing, media buying, she is currently the CEO of Greater China for Aegis Media. And KF uh, has enjoyed uh, widespread uh, respect among the professionals in Taiwan's uh, media, uh, media uh, business. Uh, her presentation would focus on the media business in Greater China, reflections on dynamics and challenges, which, is, which are, in my opinion is one of the most appropriate topic and she's one of the very few who has this uh, uh, capacity to comment on this issue. And her uh, paper's uh, discussion would be Dr. Ling Mei Huang from uh, the Sixing University. Uh, Dr. Huang is a professor in the Department of Speech Communication. And I myself would also join in, uh, in discussing KF's uh, presentation. And I believe the rules of the game is very clear, so without uh, any further delay, I will leave the uh, time control to our assistants uh, on the first row. And shall we begin with the first paper? Tim? Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming, and to the organizers one more time for a very stimulating uh, event over two days' period of time. Uh, I want to just say one last, um, make one last tribute to um, Lucy Chung. Um, I was uh, very much looking forward to seeing her on this occasion, uh, hoping that she would be able to be on this panel with us. Um, and um, also this summer, uh, I'm planning to spend uh, several months at Shushin University on uh, a kind of fellowship program that she has set up, uh, which is uh, now, I think, in its third year or so. Uh, which brings, has brought over the last several years uh, quite a number of uh, youngish scholars from uh, the PRC uh, to Taiwan to study Mingguo um, Shiqi de Xinwen. And um, uh, it is a great loss. Uh, I would, I've also collaborated uh, with Lucy Chung, um, uh, Ye Wenxin, and also Lucy's niece, Eileen uh, Zhou. Uh, in the organization of now three different workshops uh, on um, uh, the history of uh, newspaper journalism in the Republican era. Um, and we are preparing a volume uh, which unfortunately will not have anything uh, of Lucy's in it, but will, uh, I think, be dedicated to Lucy. Um, I, I want to um, mention that uh, the topic that I am speaking on today is uh, not the same uh, topic I spoke on uh, uh, very, very briefly. Uh, at an earlier uh, meeting of this group um, uh, in Berkeley uh, about a year ago. Um, I was then thinking I was going to work on uh, educational exchanges uh, across the strait, um, but because of my own interest in journalism uh, uh, as my main area of inquiry these days, I've moved to this, this new topic. <clears throat> and I apologize uh, for not having a finished paper to share uh, today. Instead, what I'm able to present are my initial thoughts on a paper I'm beginning to prepare um, on the way official views and representations of Taiwan and mainland China as seen in the two societies' medias 
have shifted over the past several decades. I propose to gauge this through an inquiry into official articulations in uh, People's Daily or Renmi Urbao and the Central Daily News, Zhongyang Urbao, respectively. My ideas are at a, tr truly at a very early stage uh, and are considerably more developed with regard to the People's Daily than they are with regard to the Central Daily News. Um, I offer them here today uh, that I may receive feedback uh, on the viability of this approach uh, and suggestions, uh, especially on the Taiwan side of um, the project. I've chosen these two newspapers for a comparison uh, because they were, they long represented the official views of the dominant political parties uh, in uh, the PRC and ROC respectively. Though neither newspaper can be said to have had exclusive control over official articulations of the respective government's views on the Taiwan mainland question, in media environments dominated by one party states, each served as an ind indispensable forum for the articulation and dissemination of views on that subject and all manner of others. Uh, in that sense, I guess, my interests are both in the storm uh, as well as developments below the storm, or to put it another way, um, in the passing of the storm uh, or downgrading of the storm's severity in hopes of blue sky days. <clears throat> I'm particularly interested in the relationship between bold and programmatic statements in the newspapers and more subtle ways uh, in which those statements were packaged in print. That is, in the relationship between the ways both direct and indirect that the two newspapers communicated ideas about the Taiwan mainland question. By reading the newspapers as multi-layered texts that encoded meanings in multiple registers, I hope to reveal the deeper structure, one might say the foundational architecture uh, undergirding the articulations that sent signals about how to think about the other side of the Taiwan Strait and the cross-strait question to other media outlets and to society as a whole. Uh, I start, though, with a, a big question mark, and that is, uh, what are the relative merits of studying official media organs, uh, such as those I've chosen, versus more independent or alternative ones? Clearly, the conclusions one might draw from a study of the former are going to be quite different from those that one might draw from studying the latter. I feel pretty confident about the value of studying the People's Daily and Central Daily News as critically important media organs before the late 1970s, when those newspapers constituted highly privileged and powerful voices within their respective social environments. In the full paper I'm envisioning, I intend to establish a baseline for the rest of the discussion by looking briefly at the two newspapers' treatment of the other side of the Taiwan Strait in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. It will be a very cursory but, uh, treatment, but I think we, it's uh, possible to uh, do such a study without having to go into great depth uh, because my sense of it is that the, the treatment was pretty formulaic um, and standard. Uh, before the start of the reform era, that is, uh, on the mainland and the lifting of martial law and the advent of multi-party democracy here on Taiwan, I, would, I plan to devote something like a third of the paper to that subject. My main focus, though, uh, will be on the fast-changing situation over the past three decades. How to locate the positions of the two newspapers within the rapidly changing worlds on both sides of the Taiwan Strait in the 80s, 90s, and uh, 2000s is going to be a much more challenging matter. Obviously, there are, always and have, uh, there are and always have been significant differences between the People's Daily and the Central Daily News, not just in terms of their ideological positions and the way they were run, but also in terms of their places within their respective media and political environments. The Central Daily News always existed in a more diversified and complicated media and ideological environment than the People's Daily. And since the lifting of martial law in Taiwan, the status of the paper um, has shifted dramatically. Indeed, it's no longer possible to speak of, a, of an official newspaper in Taiwan, and the Central Daily News doesn't even really in, exist any longer, at least uh, uh, as a, a tangible uh, document. Uh, it's only an online version um, as of, uh, I think, about two years ago. Today, the Central Daily News has to be understood as being, of, therefore, of only very marginal importance. To track the way the two newspapers have represented the other side of the Taiwan Strait, therefore, demands attention to changes over time. Uh, not just in the nature of the representations themselves, but also in the evolution of the larger media cultures uh, uh, in both places. This makes, I think, the comparison more complex and interesting and points to the importance of locating the positions of the newspapers within their particular political 
uh, and media cultures. It also points to the important issue of the two newspapers' need to compete for influence within diverse media markets, a phenomenon that now applies on the mainland as well as on Taiwan. Has it been the case that the two newspapers have been able to stay in front of uh, and shape public opinion on the Taiwan mainland question since the early 1980s? To what extent have their approaches to that subject been shaped by the prolifer prol proliferation of news sources in both societies and by the more nuanced information that has become available, widely available as a result. My pre preliminary thought is that the advent of multi-party democracy on Taiwan uh, has rendered the central daily news far less important in general, and therefore, especially with regard to the cross Straits issue, but that owing to the continuance of one-party rule on the mainland, the People's Daily has retained far greater significance. Nevertheless, I suspect that the opening of the mainland news market to a wide variety of news sources as well as to other sources of information, has forced that newspaper to react and accommodate ideas that do not originate from within Communist Party policymaking circles. In this way, I believe, a dialectical situation has come into being, such that the People's Daily, as the official organ of the ruling party, simultaneously shapes and is shaped by non-official news sources, available to and far more popular with China's news-consuming population. If this is the case, and demonstrating that it is, I think, is going to be a difficult task. It suggests that opinion in China uh, on, the tai on, Taiwan, on the Taiwan mainland question is well beyond uh, the CCP's uh, total control, a point that is clearly true for whichever party is in power in Taiwan as well. <coughs> in the remaining few minutes I, I, I have here, I wish to briefly present a few observations on the People's Daily based on a very impressionistic and fast reading of a contemporary online edition of that newspaper, um, Ren Min Wang, uh, which is uh, available to all of us uh, easily online. The advent of the internet and, on and online edition of newspapers, of course, has changed the nature of news presentation considerably, as well as consumption, um, and significant time needs to be spent, I think, considering how this is so, and also how the online editions of the two newspapers relate to and may be different from their print editions, although there is no print edition any longer of the Central Daily News. Given that the People's Daily currently competes for attention with a broad array of newspapers, uh, uh, sorry, news sources, both domestic and foreign, in my reading of the online version of the contemporary newspaper, I think it's going to be very important to be sensitive to the ways it may be read against or alongside other available information on Taiwan. Certainly people get their information from many sources, not just one. I propose to comment on a number of variables in the online version of the People's Daily. The amount of coverage given to the other side of the Taiwan Strait, the subjects covered, the placement in the newspapers of that coverage. Though I can't do so now, I eventually also intend to analyze the language used uh, in the discussion of Taiwan and vice versa, uh, I'll do the same kinds of, take the same kind of approach when studying Taiwan treatment of the mainland. The online edition of the People's Daily is comprised of a variety of news categories or sections, the majority naturally focusing on different aspects of mainland society, politics, the Chinese people, finance and economy, uh, society, environment, local news, defang, and military affairs. In addition, there are sections for international news and there are sections on Taiwan and Hong Kong, discrete sections. Taiwan is assigned the same categorical status within the newspaper as is Hong Kong. Given that Hong Kong is currently governed according to one country, two systems policy, the parallel treatment of Taiwan suggests that this is the proper intellectual structure with which to approach Taiwan as well. Indeed, the entire treatment of Taiwan by the People's Daily suggests an effort to rhetorically naturalize Taiwan as part of China. This impression uh, is reinforced by the fact that the section on Taiwan is also cross-listed in the local or defang section of the newspaper alongside China's provinces, Hong Kong and Macau. So if you click on the, the local section of the newspaper, you find all the provinces, you also find Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. On the other hand, uh, Taiwan's separate status is indicated by the fact that the Taiwan section unlike those debated, uh, devoted to the mainland's individual provinces, includes a map of the island, complete with clickable place names that deliver up information about that particular location, presumably so that readers and those considering a visit to the island can orient themselves properly. Still, for me, the impression here is of an island that is both thoroughly known and thoroughly knowable. 
there is little left to the imagination. Taiwan is a well-surveyed space and in this way is being digested by the mainland information processing and ordering system. Not surprisingly, this process is dep depicted as benign and natural. To me, the most obvious thing to note regarding coverage of Taiwan uh, in the Remier Bao is that Taiwan is depicted as a highly complex entity with a fully developed society and culture worthy of discussion from multiple perspectives. And here I suspect uh, it's going to be very, very different from what uh, we, look, we see in the 50s, 60s, and uh, 70s. One finds the expected solemn discussion of high political issues related to Taiwanese politics and the thorny question of reunification, and that material is indeed positioned very prominently. But equally as much uh, information, perhaps even the preponderance of the coverage, focuses on ordinary life in Taiwan, cultural issues, and so forth much the same as the sort of coverage given to other local areas within the country. Pop singers, wedding ceremonies, the doings of prominent Taiwanese people are all given their share of coverage, uh, as uh, are local Taiwanese politics. There's also a very large section devoted to relations between the mainland and Taiwan. The dozens of articles here concentrate on people to people subject matter and do a good job of capturing the myriad ways that people from the two sides of the Taiwan Strait are engaged in regular and fruitful interactions of all kinds. In general, the thoroughness of the coverage is impressive and has the psychological effect, I think, of suggesting that the mainland understands Taiwan very well indeed. The People's Daily's, People's Daily's intellectual reach is worthy of note and suggests that the editors of the newspaper have already incorporated ordinary life on the island into their own zone of necessary knowledge. As we know from uh, today's panels, if nothing else, there are, in addition to the local populations of readers uh, of the press on both sides of the strait, significant populations of people from the other side of the strait living in uh, both societies, many mainlanders here and many Taiwanese there mainland spouses and workers in Taiwan, and a million or so, if I've heard the figures correctly, uh, Taiwanese living full-time in mainland China. While I consider it unlikely that many of the Taiwanese who live and work in or frequently travel to the mainland are regular readers of the People's Daily, uh, those among them who might pick up a copy of the newspaper or read it online would find it, I think, to be a rather friendly and familiar source in many respects, a place to which they could potentially turn for information about their part of the greater China that spans the Taiwan Strait. And this, of course, raises the important question of the extent to which the broader media uh, is contributing to the formation of a single community or imagined community consisting of elements on both sides of the strait. While Remy Urbao is perhaps the last media organ to which one might turn to explore this sort of question, the very fact that it too lends itself to such a reading, at least in my eyes, suggests that this phenomenon, the, the creation through the media of a shared uh, sense of community, uh, is indeed an important and potentially revealing subject for further study. I made it before the bell. Thank you. Uh, I believe that uh, it's time for me to offer my comments on Tim's paper. Uh, first of all, I have to say that Tim has uh, uh, done a good job, at least uh, in coming up with a thought piece about what he is uh, about to do uh, in, in the future on a, longer, uh, on a longer version of a complete paper. However, uh, I believe that most of you uh, may have some, uh, may share my opinion when it comes to the choice of uh, media. Uh, why the People's Daily and Central Daily News. Um, I will question that because um, I would recommend, actually, if, you, if Tim, you were going to do the, uh, the longer version, I would recommend uh, picking some other newspapers or media which may have a greater influence uh, in China Take, for example, um, on the Taiwan issue. In China, Cankao Xiaoxi has a circulation of 3.18 million copies, whereas the People's Daily only have 2.8 million. And in fact, uh, in terms of the depth and its influence, People's Daily serve more as an official organ uh, than a true 
version of the, of the media uh, in our uh, perception. And also, there are other newspapers like Yangzi Wan Bao, Guangzhou Ri Bao. All these rank at least 1.8 million car circulation or 1.68 million uh, copies every day. That's my first question. And when it comes to the Central Daily News, uh, Zhongyang Ri Bao, uh, I would agree with you that it is highly marginalized. Not only that, uh, but also because uh, more often than not, uh, the Central Daily News does not reflect the true official positions of the KMT. Take, for example, during the Li Denghui era, Central Daily News does not fully reflect uh, the former President Li Denghui's uh, actual policy thinking. There is a gap between what the KMT power core has in mind and what the Central Daily News will present. And up to this day, when Ma ying has come into power, the Central Daily News is even further marginalized into a very minor role. Um, but the interesting thing I found in uh, Tim's uh, presentation is that he talked about the availability of alternative sources um, on China, which I agree completely, when he says that um, the People's Daily simultaneously shapes and is shaped by non-official news sources available to China's uh, new consuming publics. Here today, after the 1990s, especially after the year 2000, we have witnessed a very significant surge in the amount and the quality of media consumption in mainland China. In terms of the print media, uh, the newspapers uh, today, uh, as you have mentioned, and which I agree again, uh, very extensively covers Taiwan issues. And to my knowledge, uh, because not only was I uh, a member of the KMT Central Policy Committee, since year 2005, I have uh, become a news commentator for China's CCTV4 and also for several radio stations. And as a result of that, uh, I have frequent uh, contacts and inter uh, interactions with the uh, Chinese media professionals. It has become very clear that in addition to very sensitive, uh, very sensitive political issues such as uh, Taiwan independence, Xizhang, um, the Tibet issues, and maybe Falun Gong. Other than those uh, areas of highly sensitive political significance, usually the party, the Communist Party, would not interfere too much into what the uh, editors or the journalists have to say or put on the print media. In, other, in addition to that, uh, most of these professionals, almost all of them, have a clear knowledge about where the red line would be. So self-censorship obviously is, a, a, is in practice. But even that, we have seen a gradual loosening or broadening of these uh, media spaces for Taiwan's uh, Taiwan issue coverage. Um, in recent months, we have even become aware of the possibility that the uh, Chinese government would be willing to tolerate the use of Republic of China, Zhonghua Mingguo, uh, once in a while. Particularly in the movie, Jian Guo Da Ye, the, foundation, the founding of the republic, we have seen um, glimpses of Taiwan's uh, national flags, Qing Tian Bai Ri Man Di, this Man Di Hong, this Guo Qi, and also, we have seen their references to Zhonghua Mingguo and Guomingzhengfu, which is a positive development. And not only that, I would agree with Tim again, it is very interesting to notice that CCP's gradual loss or gradual loosening of control over the content of their media is a very interesting phenomenon to follow. But what it really controls, I would say, would be the uh, appointment of top officials in the media. So when you control the uh, editor-in-chief or the executive editors, essentially you control the whole media. Uh, the media professionals today in China seems to feel a lot more comfortable than what they, uh, what they had in the 70s and the 80s. 
Now, the other thing that's worthwhile in Tim's paper is that he mentioned the online version of Renminbi, which actually is a reflection of the growing importance of internet media in China. And based on my understanding, there are several ministries that are charged with the, represent, uh, with, with the responsibility of monitoring the internet media. So far up to now, there is no one single agency that controls or monitors in the internet. Therefore, you get to see a very lively discussion and coverage on the internet compared to the print media or the electronic media. Not only that, uh, only I guess in last month, CCTV opened up an IPTV.com uh, site uh, for itself, but without uh, much uh, publicity. It has been interpreted that CCTV has no choice but to start doing its own IPTV. But knowing that, it will never be able to compete what is available on the market today or on the web today. China is, uh, Chinese authorities, uh, I would argue, is somehow at a loss as to how to ex control or monitor the internet uh, media. And they have also been very confused by the recent developments of uh, more effective communication, uh, TV streaming on the, over the uh, telephones, over the, uh, what we call the intelligent telephones. Now, these cellular phones have become very effective uh, tools for communication. So in the future, I guess everything is in a state of flux. China is trying to get a grip with what is going on in the media environment, whereas the political situation across the street has become increasingly uh, peaceful and closer. And I have another uh, piece of information to offer to Tim. That, that is, if you carefully study the different newspapers and the electronic uh, versions of the newspapers on the internet, you will see that there is a very high percentage of shared contents among these media. Uh, why, the, uh, why so, you uh, people uh, in the PRC? Because in China, whenever it comes to Taiwan, there is a very popular saying in it, which actually has become almost a, a rules of the game. It's called Se Tai Wu Xiao Si. Uh, in English, they, it means that there is nothing minor when it comes to Taiwan affairs. So the media professionals and the media operators, they know very clearly whenever it comes to Taiwan issue, uh, and whenever it comes to any political issues regarding Taiwan, they will always follow the mainstream voice. So they will always say Zhu Xuan Lu, the main chorus. Uh, once you follow the Zhu Xuan Lu, you will never be able to, be able to uh, get into trouble. So that's what the, um, the rules of the game have become. Um, again, on the other side of the Taiwan Strait in, in Taiwan, I would recommend Tim go further into the uh, China Times and the United Daily, because these two, and also, of course, the Zio uh, Shibao, the Freedom Times. These three, I would argue, uh, probably reflect the majority of ta how Taiwanese think about mainland China. And only these three probably have a far more accurate grip on how the authorities in Taipei really think about mainland China. Uh, this is so much for my comments. But overall, I would uh, say that this is a very interesting piece. It has also uh, uh, stimulated my thinking on the role of media, uh, especially in the print media area across the, uh, in the cross-strait relations. Okay, thank you very much, thank Tim. You. And next we will have uh, KF to give, our, give us your thoughts on Great China business in the media.
就是这个，这个干嘛？哦、oh, ，Good afternoon, everyone. Um, to me, this could be the first time I talk in a very academic kind of environment. Um, in the past 24 years, actually, I'm I'm uh, working for advertising agency, uh, most of the time in in Taiwan. But uh, I got the opportunity to work uh, across three uh, Greater China market, uh, especially focus on Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, and uh, relatively less time in Hong Kong and Taiwan. And I'm very glad like, I can share my experience and observation about how the media business is happening in uh, the greater China market and how would that be the opportunity for Taiwan especially. Okay. I think why China become the focus of the, all the global uh, company, first because it has the scale and still growing very fast. So when you come to the scale and size, um, uh, in my speech, there isn't really a comparison between uh, China with Taiwan or Hong Kong. So my first session will be more focused on China market dynamics and with reference to Taiwan and Hong Kong with regards to opportunities. In terms of size, also China is on its way to becoming the largest media market as its growth far exceed that of any other market. The global economic recession slowed the growth for China in 2009. However, we still see China are able to maintain a double digit growth in terms of advertising spending. And you look at the com commercial uh, consumer market, the TV household, cable household, mobile phone user, newspaper, internet user, I think China rank number one. In terms of advertising market, uh, China just um, exceed Japan, become world's number two advertising market in the world. This growth will primarily come from the rapid urbanization of the low tier cities which is attracting all the major consumer marketing companies to focus on investing in these markets and therefore enabling the development of the media. Look at the chart, you can see in terms of urbanization, uh, China still have a big room to, to grow. Um, it's about 20 million people move from, urban, move from rural to urban every year in China. So it's like uh, moving uh, New, York, New York City's population into the urban area. So uh, everybody says China is not just one market. Uh, in China, there are more than 150 country capitals has a population more than 1 million people. And about thousands of towns with a population between 500,000 and 1 million. So when the in disposable income, familiarity with foreign brands, retail and distribution practice change dramatically when moving from uh, first tier city to lower cities. So um, when the, the consumer become more affluent with the, the size, it's a big market for consumer product and also for luxury goods. Come to the core of today's uh, focus, media. Um, Actually, China is already the second large media market in the world, and the growth still remains uh, very strong. Compared to Taiwan and Hong Kong, I think they are relatively small. But with the maturity from Taiwan and Hong Kong, I think that's the opportunity that Taiwan can contribute to uh, China's media business. Okay. China media market is big, but still, uh, has a very big room to grow. We can see uh, on the chart some statistics that in terms of advertising spending per capita, uh, China only two to three percent of the level of the, the American. And uh, in terms of revenue of cable household, it's only two to three percent of the level of the US. And China's firm box office sales have grown 40 percent annually over the past four years. But 
only represent 5% of the U.S. sales. Okay. And only in terms of internet penetration, China has only 23% compared to the advanced market like UK, Australia, they've been reached more than 70%. So China in terms of internet market, although they already have the biggest citizen, uh, netizen in, in China, but still have a big room to grow. Okay, uh, China could be the most complex and um, um, fragmented market, uh, media market in the world. Compared to the TV channels, um, you can see um, China has 3,000 TV channels compared to US three, uh, 600. In terms of newspaper titles, uh, China has 2,000 and the American has 1,400. In terms of magazine, China has 9,500. It's very uh, complex and, and fragmented. In terms of media uh, proliferation, just in 20 years, China's TV channel grow from 1,200 to 3,000, and newspaper from 500 to 2,000, magazine from 1,500 to near uh, 10,000, and in terms of radio, 1,500 to 2,400. And we can see the uh, proliferation will be become even uh, further for the uh, TV uh, when the, the, the city development into second and third tier cities. We also interested in looking at how the advertisers are investing in three different markets. We can see there are some uh, common uh, big multinational clients like Procter & Gamble, Unilever, L'Oreal, Coca-Cola, Yum, Yum, including uh, uh, KFC, uh, Pizza Hut, and Pepsi Cola across three markets. But you can see the local advertiser spending occupy much bigger share in the China market. I think that also represented the opportunity for the uh, Taiwan, Taiwan marketing company or uh, marketing professional. They can contribute in help the China local company to upgrade into the more multinational kind of marketing practice. Uh, because my job, every day we're dealing with the media buying environment, and three markets are very different. China is a very sales market. Uh, they have high um, regulation, have massive vendors. For example, I think for the people come from the States or from the Europe, you can see all the outdoor vendor, maybe you're only talking about three or four, like JC Deco, Viacom, Clear Channel. But in China, we need to deal with uh, uh, 35,000 vendors. So in terms of the efficiency and in terms of effectiveness, it's really more challenging in China. And also because the highly fragmented, so it change in terms of media measurement how to, you can help the client to spend the money uh, up to the optimal efficiency. And in China, two are very um, kind of popular practice is pre-buy option. Every year, CCTV, they have an annual option. And all the major player, all the major marketing player, they need to secure a certain uh, media airtime at the beginning of the year, which means when you compete in China, you need to commit a very big spending if your product want to cover a uh, nationwide markets. And in terms of the, the rule of the game, actually it's very people driven, not like Taiwan, it's totally kind of open and free competition kind of media uh, uh, buying market. And in terms of transparency, China for the international publication, most of them, they already entered the ABC, they accept the ABC circulation audit uh, practice, but compared to Taiwan, because I think uh, maybe some uh, historical and uh, political background, uh, in Taiwan only two to three newspaper uh, accept the ABC uh, audit. And compared to Hong Kong, it's much a simpler media market, a uh, few TV stations, few newspaper. So the way they run the media is very systematic and very transparent. 
and advertiser uh, uh, adopt the open, uh, open bidding for their airtime, and it's very commercial driven. And ma the major print media already uh, accept the ABC uh, audit. So when we look at the media uh, development among three markets, I think Taiwan and Hong Kong kind of leading in terms of the mature maturity and in terms of corporate management and in terms of measurement. So I think a lot of Hong Kong and Taiwan experience and know-how can be helped in China when they develop into a more mature, more uh, more fo focus on efficiency and effective effectiveness kind of management. So uh, that's also the opportunity for Taiwan uh, professionals. And how I see the factor that will impact China media market in the next five to 10 years, I think the government control is still a core will influence how the media develop and how the competition uh, going on with the international players. And how the, uh, we also interested to see how WTO uh, can influence China's uh, media uh, business. And in we all know all, a lot of capital going to China, all the hard money are investing in China's media, especially for outdoor media, digital, and TV. And we, will, we are looking for uh, more active uh, merger and acquisition will be happening in the media business. Here, just some uh, example how the government control media. All the advertising must be approved and internet size, outdoor size, subject to government's bans. So today you, you can see the outdoor tomorrow, it can be tail down without the reasons. And TV and newspaper uh, is owned by government with limits on foreign involvement. And local government impre implement, implement policy to protect local advertiser and vendors, which can result in uh, preferential treatment and hamper fair negotiation for all advertiser, especially for the multinational clients. And so far, um, you cannot see a lot of foreign uh, content in China. There's no foreign channel uh, legally available to general residents. You can only see those foreign channels in three star and above level hotels. And foreigner community building allowed to receive foreign channels through satellite. Some channels uh, cooperate with local channels to carry their program for certain time periods. And that, that's something quite interesting is from the ITV TV. Actually, people can see a lot of Taiwan programs through the IP, IP TV, internet TV. Okay. And even the content is highly regulated. They control how much time you can broadcast advertising. And they, for the prime time, there's no inside program break during the prime time. And no imported programming during the prime time. All the kids' cartoon uh, imported from the foreign country cannot be aired during the prime time. And sensitive programming uh, is prohibited, including politics or religions, okay, for example. How the WTO membership has impacted the media? I think it increased the foreign competition. The licensing agreement with the international publication is increasing like magazine, but still limited TV uh, lending right for a few foreign channels. Maybe you can only see uh, uh, broader coverage from MTV and more global player uh, in outdoor because nothing to do with the contents. So it's only hardware. So it's uh, the international player can have bigger room to, to participate in the China media market. And more structure and movement towards the global standards and greater accountability in terms of media research and circulation audit. But it's still a protective market where foreign media ownership is non-existent with only limited opportunity for media owners in the areas of program and content syndication licenses. However, the China government is carefully prepared for the open. Uh, I think recently you can see uh, for the major TV station like SMG, the Shanghai Media Group, uh, they already kind of separate their 16 channels 
into 16 independent companies, so allow them to cooperate with international players one by one under the space, the pace of control. Okay. Or for example, they separate the uh, uh, channel uh, management and content production. So they still can control how the, the programming, but in terms of production, they are now have more opportunity to work with international players, including Taiwan's uh, production company. And we also start to see uh, the consolidation happening. Uh, more and more uh, China big media company or group will get IPO. So with the, the capital, I think they will come back to China and consolidate uh, the smaller player. We also see some um, cross-media consolidation. For example, the Sina.com and Fox Media has been uh, in the strong indication that they may consolidate from the TV and internet, or outdoor and internet. Okay. I think the future outlook, the opportunity, I think many come from the audience hungry for information and entertainment. Okay. And also the international marketer still very confident in China's uh, consumer market expanding to the second tier to fourth tier cities. So I see the synergy among greater China market will come from the uh, entertainment programming and the music and how we merchandise the Taiwan artists and also the demand for the experience um, professional in terms of management, uh, the media business. Okay. And I think digital also a big area for the Chi uh, Taiwan and China to work together. China has a big market, Taiwan has a technology. So I think that's a great opportunity that we can do something at the digital and uh, media technology side, like in the search marketing, e-commerce, B2P platform, and digital publication, and online gaming. Okay. In summary, I think Taiwan have the advantage to participate China's media development in terms of creativity and culture, capital in talents and, and money. Okay. But I think the challenge is still there. Uh, I think you need more understanding of each other and the mutual respect. And also need to have a more open and fairness of the commercial uh, environment. Okay, thank you. Thank you uh, for Ms. Lee's presentation. It's, uh, uh, at least from my viewpoint, this is a brilliant uh, presentation, uh, very extensive coverage. And here we have uh, Professor Huang to give us her, her thoughts on this uh, KF's presentation. <coughs> Okay, I think it's my great honor of me to be here. And uh, I think as you know, the original arrangement, she's uh, Lucy Chains will work with me you know, to come up, you know, today's, you know, discussions, the content. But unfortunately, uh, she was very ill. So uh, I d did not get any chance, you know, to uh, work with her and uh, to, um, see you know, what kind of point that she wanted to present the, in today's section. But it's a great relief because uh, our moderator say uh, he, he will provide some comments on <laughs> KF Lee's uh, presentations too. So I think I feel free you know, to uh, give some uh, comments you know, from uh, the areas of my interest is uh, conflicts management and the communication. So maybe you know, I will you know, stimulate some uh, discussions you know, from this uh, very different the perspectives of you. Okay, so today's uh, my comments will uh, uh, is from the, the topics you know, from the, the past you know, to uh, win-win solutions between China and uh, uh, Taiwan. 
I think it is pretty safe to say that you know people say in Taiwan uh, doesn't want a war between China say and the Taiwan. But you know when it comes to the time, you know uh, both parties sit down and the to reach an agreement. Uh, peoples in Taiwan are more concerned about what kind of peace agreement you know, w w will we get. You know, it, it is to, to both sides' advantage, or is it only to you know one size to uh, mainland China's this interest? So, the the key questions is, uh, oops, let me see. Are, are we ready? It's very real. You know, this is the different. You know, <laughs> it's not this file. Okay, it th doesn't matter. So, I think it, it, the the po the questions is very important for for us to think is are we ready for pursuing a win win solution? Oh. A as we know, you know, when parties in conflict. They want to sit down and uh, pursue a win-win solution. There are two very important critical factors. One of them is subjective uh, factors. It's the willingness, you know, from the both sides. You know, both sides are willingness to are willing to sit down and uh, to, um, I mean, you know, to uh, 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 take care of, you know, the other side's the interest, not only. I mean, you know, not only to look after uh, you know, our own size and you know, interest, and the the uh, this uh, subjective the matrix is about you know the asymmetries of the powers. So you know, uh, my impression you know from KF Lee's you know paper, my impression is it's difficult. I mean, it is more likely for Taiwan to become uh, dependent on China. It is very difficult, you know. Ac actually, there is no much room, you know, for uh, interdependence between Ta China and the Taiwan. So, you know, I doubt, you know, uh, there will be a uh, an interdependence between China and the Taiwan. So maybe there won't be any chance for us to have the subjective conditions for pursuing a win-win solution. And another critical factors is uh, objective factors. Uh, both parties, you know, have to have to be um, able to uh, know how to uh, pursue a win-win solution. I mean that uh, both parties that have to have uh, enough problem-solving capability. It um, it it has something to do with the. Uh, open communications and uh, uh, mutual understanding. Uh, although, um, I mean, for China and the Taiwan, we speak the same language, and uh, sort of we have the same, you know, cultural inheritance. But actually, after 60 years separations, do we know each other, or you know, do we understand each other well? You know, to kind of create or to develop the atmospheres for the mutual, you know, understanding and which is very critical factors for pursuing, uh, I mean, the win-win solutions. You know, in my opinion, I think it's very important for political leaders on both sides to avoid that, avoid this kind of situations. Maybe there is no, you know, subjective, you know, condition, and uh, there is no objective condition, you know, for both sides to pursue a win-win solution. And uh, uh, in in my opinion, it is not only political leaders on both sides have to uh, avoid this kind of situation. You know, I think you know, a journalist or Media scholars, they have to avoid this situation too, because um, news media can play a very critical role. You know, you know, to create a, a more you know friendly you know atmosphere, or I mean, you know, to uh, offer 
you know, more uh, positive image of both sides so, you know, we can, you know, overcome, you know, certain, you know, political uh, obstacles and the journa uh, journalists the obstacle and uh, to create a more, you know, friendly context for both sides to pursue a uh, win-win solutions. So uh, it comes to, you know, today's the topic, you know, the uh, media role, you know, uh, on the path to win-win uh, solutions. So as I uh, mentioned, uh, it, it is very difficult, you know, for the political uh, leaders on both sides to pursue a win-win solution if uh, we don't have uh, subjective and uh, objective conditions for pursuing a win-win solution. And so under these circumstances, in my opinion, uh, news media actually can do a lot of things to create, you know, this kind of conditions. But how? So uh, for uh, coming to this conference, I surveyed, you know, a lot of the journal articles, and I, I found some very interesting articles. So I just pick up, you know, uh, Professor Ulfsfeld, you know, from Hebrew Universities of Jerusalem. Uh, he and uh, his colleagues, you know, did a lot of, you know, research, you know, uh, to find out, you know, how to, um, how to uh, create a more uh, positive uh, atmosphere for the to for the, the both party, you know, in conflict. So, so I can I can use uh, Professor Woodfield and his colleagues, you know, theoretical framework and uh, to offer, you know, some um, some insights. Uh, into uh, today's you know, topic. Uh, from according to Woodfield and his colleagues, uh, they uh, suggest that there are uh, three you know, obstacles. Uh, journalists or uh, the media scholars you know, have to pay attention to. So you know, media, news media can play a more constructive role, you know, uh, when it comes to, you know, when two parties, you know, want to sit down and uh, to uh, reach a uh, peace, you know, agreement. The, the first, uh, you know, variable, the fir first critical factors is the, the relative powers of the two sides. A as I, you know, pointed out, you know, at the beginnings, there is not much room, you know, for uh, an interdependence between China say, and uh, Taiwan. You know, it, it is more likely, you know, for Taiwan to depend uh, on China. So uh, I think it, it, it media scholars has uh, have to pay uh, a lot of attention on, you know, to see if there is a, a atmospheres in the news flow. Uh, I mean, you know, because according to uh, Woodsville's uh, research result, they found that the more powerful countries has much less news about the weaker country. And it's not a good news because maybe, you know, the general public in the more powerful countries will get involved, you know, will get enough you know, information, you know, about the other sides. So we have to uh, uh, to 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 uh, uh, pay attention to the 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 news media coverage. You know how much the qualities of the more powerful size. You know how much you know news you know coverage is about the other size. And the, uh, another you know uh, aspects we have to pay attention to is the the weak countries will you know have. Uh, a lot more, you know, coverage than, you know, uh, about the more powerful, you know, country. But the bad news is most of this coverage is negative. So when, uh, as a, a media scholar or as a, a professional journalist, we, we have to, you know, pay attention to this kind of uh, asymmetrical, you know, flows of uh, news and uh, the, you know, the, 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 you know, more, you know, negative, you know, coverage, you know, from the weak size of country. And another, 
the second uh, obstacles, you know, we have to overcome is to, you know, come up with a, a more friendly, you know, context for pursuing a win-win solution. Says uh, we, we have to pay attention to the, uh, you know, the levels of uh, hostility. Uh, Woodsville, according to Woodsville and his colleagues, they pointed out that uh, um, when actual events happen, uh, news media will uh, have a lot of negative, you know, coverage. For example, you know, when the news media cover reports, you know, ECFA talks, and when. Uh, news media report, you know, U.S. arms arms sales to Taiwan. Yeah. We we have to uh, pay attention to uh, if there are more negative, you know, coverage, you know, than you know positive the coverage, you know, about the other sides, because you know from the point, you know, from. Uh, the the professors the Woodfields you know uh, argues that you know if there are too many negative uh, coverage from both you know from each side you know about the other side you know it's not good you know for you know the mutual you know understanding and uh, the mutual trust and then the third uh, obstacle you know the journalists that have to overcome is the norms of the journalism. A as we know, you know, the journalist is have a obsessive, you know, interest, you know, about the the the, the violence, you know, the conflicts, the, you know, the bad news, you know. So we have to uh, avail that, you know. Uh, maybe we can uh, do some agenda setting. I mean, for the political leaders or for you know, someone who is really concerned about, you know, creating the, uh, uh, I mean, you know, more, you know, uh, helpful context for pursuing win-win uh, solutions. L they have to provide, you know, some, you know, more, you know, positive uh, uh, issue or positive, you know, subjects, you know, for uh, journalists to cover and then uh, they uh, they think you know those you know topics no those subjects are are newsworthy, uh, but you know those topic is is more you know uh, positive, not you know negative. Uh, so these are three you know obstacles you know for the journalist or for uh, media scholars to you know uh, consider. You know if we are uh, want to. If we want to uh, create a more uh, friendly, you know, context, you know, for people uh, or for political leaders or for the general public, you know, to uh, think, you know, from a win-win, I mean, uh, orientation, you know, not from a, a win-lose, you know, mindset and uh, uh, with the regards to the cross stress in the issues. Uh, we have to, you know, just uh, uh, overcome, you know, these three, you know, obstacles. So, uh, in my uh, opinions, uh, we, uh, when we uh, come to the, uh, when we look at the case of the cross stress the relations, there are uh, three, you know, futures, the study, you know, directions for futures, the studies. Uh, one of them is, I think, you know, teams' uh, papers is very important. You know, uh, we need, you know, a lot more, you know, uh, study, you know, such as teams. So we will get a, a more, you know, we will get a whole pictures about the qualities and the, the quantity of news coverage, you know, from each side. You know, how the China, you know, reports the Taiwan, you know, how the Taiwan so reports the Vietnam China. And then uh, the second direction for the future studies is we, we have to expose the types of uh, news stories uh, which uh, uh, can it just manages to overcome political and uh, journalist uh, obstacles and uh, provide a more positive uh, images of the, the other side. And the last one is, you know, I think this is a very interesting um, uh, development. Uh, we can consider, 
is this the appropriate, you know, for us to apply a so-called uh, peace journalist program to media coverage of cross trade relations? It means that, you know, it is not only for the political leaders uh, who have to have, to have a win-win mindset. Uh, the journalists or the media scholars, all of them, you know, have to have a win-win mindset. So when they you know, report the, uh, the actual news event uh, about with regards to cross trade you know, issues, they will have a de-escalation oriented conflict reporting and a solution oriented conflict reporting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Huang, for a very uh, in-depth analysis of this paper. Uh, here, as, uh, as requested by Yu Sun, I have to offer my uh, comments and my uh, thoughts on KF's uh, piece. <coughs> Uh, first of all, I have to uh, give you some anecdotal stories about uh, my experience in China. Uh, about three or four years ago, I had a chance to, uh, to go into a movie um, audition. And um, sitting next to me at, uh, over the dinner, or in, in the later on over the dinner table, sitting next to me was a very old gentleman. But um, somebody told me he, he's, he's a VIP in China's media business. I had no idea that they told me he is uh, Huang Fuping. For some of you who knows uh, something about China's politics, uh, Huang Fuping is the guy who wrote a series of editorials before Deng Xiaoping's famous visit to Shenzhen in 1992. So, so I naturally almost stood up and, and showed, uh, paid my respect to the uh, gentleman. Then we had a very lengthy discussion over the role of media and the powerful influence of mass media over uh, China's uh, 1.3 billion population. He gave me an example. He said, you know, he was the uh, deputy editor-in-chief for People's Daily back in Deng Xiaoping's days. And he said, you know, even they themselves did not realize how powerful People's Daily back in those days can be, can, uh, could become. He said, one day, somebody print a very little, tiny about this, this large piece of uh, uh, information, which uh, talks about the possible uh, lack of supply for daily salt, you know, the salt you use in cooking, in Yunnan area. Only this big a piece of coverage. Maybe less than 100 words, 50, 60 words at most. The next day, uh, a riot broke up in Yunnan because people lined up to, to grab any salt they can get from the store uh, shelves. And they were shocked. The uh, People's Daily editorial staff gathered together and to examine what happened with this story. Nothing. It's just a piece of information. But it goes to show the, the role of media and the powerful impact it could have in China. Another story is about my, my uh, role as a news commentator in, on CCTV's Channel 4. The, I appear usually twice or three times a, a week uh, on, on China's CCTV 4. So naturally, quite a few number of people know, get to know me over, over the uh, TV screen. And one day, the, um, one of the staff called me up and said, congratulations, you, you, know, you, you hit a record number. So what record? He said, well, you know, obviously the ratings. I said, how much? He gave me a number. I couldn't exactly remember how much. He said, and, and he said, you know, this, was, this is the highest since the, uh, the inception of this program. I said, oh, I said, can you, then I said, can you tell me uh, how many people were viewing last night? He said, it's about um, 100 million people. It's amazing. And later on, when I get to China nowadays, now I get to see their rating report. And I know every night when I appear on the CCTV4, an average of 70 to 80 million viewers are watching me. That, uh, that gave me a hard time because I can no longer do something I really want to do in China. The things I cannot do in Taiwan because I'm a professor. 
try to uh, try to play naughty, but it's 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 just impossible because in China the media has such a broad impact on people's daily lives. But recently, as KF's uh, presentation can show us, China's media has gone through a, a, a I would say almost a sea change. It's a very deep, very extensive transformation of the China's media environment. It has become much more commercialized. This is what I would call the marketization of Chinese media. Chinese media is no longer simply the organ for, uh, for the Communist Party. It is no longer just an, uh, an, an instrument. It has become a business in itself. So the inevitable commercialization of Chinese media is what follows. And then you also get to see, as happened in most Western media environment, the tabloidization of Chinese media. One particular uh, example, which Susan Shirk also cited in her uh, famous book, uh, The Fragile Power, is the Global Times, Huanqiu Shibao, which is under the guidance of uh, Renmin Ribao, part of the uh, People's Daily uh, Group. Huanqiu Shibao has become probably one of the most popular newspapers in China today. But if you look at the coverage stories every day, Oftentimes, you might think that you are, you, you are uh, in, uh, in America's uh, supermarket uh, uh, counter because you're looking at amazing stories which could never be true. And it tells about uh, how the Japanese are trying to invade China again. It talks about how Americans are plotting to overthrow the Chinese communist leadership. These kind of incredible stories may sound incredible to you as an intellectual, but it sells in the market. So Susan Shirk also correctly pointed out, whenever it comes to any issue that involves America, Japan, or Taiwan, that would be the hot, that would be the hot selling uh, issue for sure. Um, when I appear on CCTV, the editors tell me, if you talk about Taiwan independence, if you talk about the arms race between Taiwan and China, if you talk about the link between Japan and Taiwan and, and China, it is a guaranteed rating uh, success. So this is how we see. On the other hand, the editors and the journalists in the media, not only do they realize this trend, they are also uh, involved in this, in this trend um, deeply. Be the reasons are that they get their bonus pay every month if your rating, if your circulation gets up. So whenever they can have a high rating show, they will get extra bonus point, which would turn into cash at the end of the month. That's why you can understand the motive for profits drives China's uh, media today, even if it comes to when it comes to the political issues. Now, KF also pointed out correctly that entertainment, music, and advertising are very, very profitable and potential areas uh, for cross-trade exchanges. And toward the end, she pointed out the role of digital media. The development of digital media in China's television industry is only a recent experience. Um, what they have is the hardware. They have the most sophisticated TV streaming technology. They have the best hardware you can get on the global marketplace. Yet, they don't have enough contents to fill all the channels. Take, for example, Discovery Channel. Discovery Channel in China has been there for at least over 10 years or close to two decades. But they have not yet been able to turn its uh, record into a profitable one. Yet, over the past uh, six months or so, the Chinese authorities have approached Discovery Channel uh, by themselves and asked for cooperation in digital contents because Discovery Channel is probably the largest uh, media 
that offers digital contents today uh, in, the te in the television business. China does, have, does not have enough digital content. That is one area why KF suggested that Taiwan would have a golden opportunity to move into. Taiwanese uh, professionals, in the, Taiwanese media professionals, have not yet quite realized that um, China market is a golden land, a golden virgin land for them. And even for the multinational, the global players, they also realize the scale and the market size which KF uh, painted just earlier on is really probably the last piece of golden land uh, for the media business in the world. Yet at the same time, as KF pointed out, and I would agree, the complexity of its market structures is not just the central government, you also have the local governments. These bureaucrats are not that stupid as you may, or not that dumb as you may imagine. In fact, on the contrary, these are very sharp business people. These people know exactly what they want. So they may not be able to come up with creative contents, but certainly these uh, bureaucrats that monitor or that control the Chinese media certainly know how to turn themselves into a profitable business. And in the, uh, and the last uh, point I want to make is that while the Chinese uh, ruling party, the, uh, the CCP, has a very strong grip and control over its media content because they know if they want to stay in power, they will never let go the control over media. And this is why when KF described um, the foreign channel's inability to land in China, this is, is no surprise because Chinese would not give away uh, its media contents to foreign channels, at least in the recent future. But creativity is something that they lack. Creativity plus culture plus capital. Taiwan at least excels in two areas. One is the creativity, the other is the cultural part. But Chinese have the capital that other people may not be able to come up with. So in Taiwan, no t movie producer or TV producer would be willing or dumb enough to invest huge amount, millions of dollars into the production of any single item. But with China's market size, you can imagine how investors would be willing to do that. I have one friend, the last anecdotal story. I have a friend who is a Chinese bureaucrat and he worked in the State Department. He was so smart. He talked to the tier two and tier three cities, TV stations, about 200 of them. So he told them, give me one hour's nine o'clock slot and I'll give you one hour's uh, TV program, which uses the, um, the serials from the uh, from Taiwan called the peop, uh, stories like uh, Chong Yao stories, Tai Yang Hua series. All these are very cheap uh, serials. Uh, what, what do you call that? What is that? Um, what is that? Series. series, mini series from Taiwan. Old mini series, but cheap. He bought them from Taiwan and he put them on those 200 stations. If an, and in return, he only asked for five minutes time for advertising. Toward the end, he became a multi-millionaire because of that five minutes time at the same time, nine o'clock every night, over 200 stations. So China is really a land of opportunity, opportunity not, only for, not only for global player, players, but also for Taiwanese professionals. Thank you. Okay, here we conclude our uh, discussion and, uh, and we would like to open the floor for all the, uh, all the uh, participants in this uh, seminar. Time for Q&A. I have a question for uh, KF. Uh, can you say something about the merger? That is, um, does it involve um, um, merger or merging entities which are across the strait, that is one from Taiwan, another from originally from PRC, and if so, how does it work? Uh, 
Because I think the major player, they, are, they were looking for downloads in the NASDAQ or Hong Kong stock market. So I think it's not just from the local capital. They, they get on to the international capital market to get the money and to reinvest. And the same, I think, for Taiwan, uh, media player, they can also do the same to, to get, in, get participate into China's uh, media business. Yeah. Yes, this question is for Tim. Um, I always have this impression that China has walked into Taiwan's past. <laughs> Namely, uh, they have a authoritarian government guiding a rapid growing economy and use the uh, achievement, economic performance to buttress the re regime's legitimacy. So it's very much like in Taiwan's past. And, and so when you are comparing uh, the Central Daily News and People's Daily, I'm wondering would it be uh, more interesting or fruitful if you are not comparing the two newspapers in the same time, but rather in the same uh, degree or level of development of commercialization. For example, probably comparing today's People's Daily and uh, uh, Central uh, Daily, Doyang uh, Rebao News, before lifting of martial law and see how similar um, instruments of control and also similar degree of commercialization uh, would, would interact with each other. That would be, I think, very um, um, fruitful um, because I've been watching TV and so on and so forth. And when I watch mainland TV programs, it reminds me of the kind of TV that I saw when I was um, um, in the junior high school. Thank you. I think that's a very interesting suggestion. I've been puzzling over that because we have this this great gap uh, in terms of, of where the two societies are and how to how to treat it. I guess the only concern I have is it starts to look more like uh, a social scientist paper than it does a historian's paper, um, which I'm less qualified to write. Um, but and it also might sound like I'm uh, there's a predictive element to to what I'd be writing. Um, but I agree with you that that's the natural comparison. It's a much more natural comparison. Uh, so somehow I need to figure that, that relationship out. Um, and it, it seems to me that, um, that, that, that that's, that's, a, that's the absolutely opposite <laughs> comparison. So mm -hmm. I like the idea. I, but I also want to remain a historian uh, and, and treat this as a historical subject. Actually, I think I overlooked, uh, I bypassed one uh, important step that uh, the two of you may have to uh, make a response to what we have to, oh. what we said earlier on. Mm -hmm. well, Tim, why don't you take this opportunity to do okay. that? Um, well, I thank you very much for your very useful comments. Um, I'd like to interview you, actually, uh, now that I uh, know more about what you do. Um, uh, let's see here. I wasn't quite clear, actually. Let me return uh, a question, your comment with a, a question. When, whether, when you were recommending Tsang Kao Xiaoxi versus Renmi Rabal, whether or not that was uh, for the, again, the past or whether you're talking about uh, contemporary, uh, uh, are you questioning, in other words, the uh, in relevance and importance and circulation of Renmi Rabal uh, pre reform era? Uh, then, two, are, you, are those figures you gave me? read to us about Tsang Kao Shaoxi. Mm -hmm. When did they come from? Uh, those figures are based on the 2008 circulation number. Uh, but I, what I was uh, referring to is that I thought that the second half of your research would be a lot more interesting to um, the general public and to the scholarly uh, community because it is obviously uh, a lot uh, more uh, intriguing to us about what happened in the post-reform era, particularly in the 1990s to the year uh, 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this is probably the period in which the most dynamic, uh, vibrant changes take place. Right. So your suggestion then would be the, the, for that era yeah. to, to look at some Yeah. So the second half of your research, should, uh, I okay. thought, would be really okay. interesting. I think that the, the question really becomes whether or not the looking at official media relevance makes sense at all. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's a, it goes back 
to the question of whether or not um, you look at up to a certain point when there was a real monopoly of control. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after that point in time, uh, that perhaps has to be dispensed with uh, as an approach. Uh, and you have to acknowledge the full vibrancy of the, the media world. Then mm -hmm. somehow select um, within that two indices. Okay, KF, do you have anything to say? Yeah, yeah I think uh, by listening to uh, Professor Fang and uh, Professor Zhen's uh, comments, actually like kind of uh, twist my angle to look at the, the influential power of the media. Okay, <laughs> I think even we, maybe in terms of business, there are not much independent between two, two markets. But in terms of professional now working in China, I think, just for example, that few minutes that Mr. Uh, Professor Zhen talking on the TV, I think that can make a big influence on how people see China, uh, see Taiwan, and how they see the future together. And also, I think the Professor Huang talking about uh, the how the media, the angle they report uh, each uh, market that can really help uh, the two markets uh, mutual understanding. So although I'm focused on, on business, but after today, I, I think I also learned a lot that media actually is very influential for the future uh, cross-trade relationship. Yeah. Okay, back to everybody. Any Q questions, please? A, a question for Tim. I'm, I'm struck here that you're, you're struggling with how much you can read <laughs> official ideology from your sources. And uh, th there's always that tension, obviously, between the, the production side of ideology and the reception side of ideology. And just in thinking about the focus on newspapers, um, particularly for the early post-49 period on the mainland, uh, you're ru basically than ruling out a population that maybe wouldn't have had the literacy skills or the access to read newspapers. And so one possibility would be to think for that period beyond written texts and think about what were other avenues for circulating official propaganda. And having done research on coastal Fujian, I can say that propaganda folk songs were one way that cadres instilled ideas about Taiwan and about cross-strait conflict. So there, I think there are other genres you could consider expanding to. Obviously, that would make the comparative dimension a little stickier, um, but something to think about. Any other questions or comments? No, oh, yes. Um, I don't, I don't do that much with media, so uh, this might be a silly question, but my understanding is that um, uh, foreign media, uh, international news in China is, is all supposed, especially in written newspapers, is supposed to be Xinhua uh, news service. Is that right? Is that, uh, anyway, so, so my question then is, is whether or not Taiwan or how Taiwan fits into those kind of categorizations as far as whether it needs to be reported from Xinhua, taken from Xinhua news service, or if it, it is actually the local, the actual local newspaper who gets mm -hmm. to choose the content. Yeah. And of course, there's a lot of ways around that for international news, especially sure. like combining it with domestic news, economics mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. But I'm just wondering how those those regulations play out. And Tim, do you want to comment on that? Um, it's a good question to ask and something I, I'd like to know more about too. I mean, what, I got a question yesterday from somebody um, who I don't believe is here today, but is a journalist uh, with the, an English language paper here in, in Taipei. And, and he was asking, um, what were the sources of all of the information about Taiwan that, uh, that appear in mainland press? Um, and uh, I really, it's, it's, it's not transparent. So that would, re that would require uh, you know, finding, talking to somebody who's involved in the process. Um, another really interesting I'm, question that, that he asked is whether or not the cover if, if it's lifted and borrowed more or less from a Taiwanese news production world, um, is the content changed? Um, uh, is, it, uh, is it portrayed, is it say a story? He was asking actually about something that he 
Rob would be interested in about um, religious questions. Um, it, so if, if there's a story about religiosity, popular religion in Taiwan, uh, that, and that gets borrowed and put in the, that, and that's produced in Taiwan for a Ta uh, Taiwanese audience, and then that gets lifted and put in a uh, mainland press, um, is it changed? Is it uh, depicted differently? Um, I don't know. Those are very interesting questions. Yes, so I, yes. Uh, Kay, if you had you got something to offer, I would love to hear. Um, if I may offer my uh, uh, limited knowledge on this. The Chinese media, uh, first of all, they have very little respect for intellectual property rights. So uh, whenever they lifted something from the Taiwanese media, uh, it's usually whatever they wish and they will do, they will do so. And they will not usually, usually they will not change the contents except in certain uh, terms, for, for example, uh, there was a Taiwanese leader, Ma Yingzhou. They will not use Taiwanese president. Uh, they, will, they will not use president's office. They will use Ma Yingzhou's office. They will not use the minister. They will use the person in charge of the interior affairs, the person in charge of the foreign uh, relations. Uh, uh, this is uh, what they would do. And secondly, it, you are right. Uh, whenever it comes to important issues or questions regarding Taiwan, they must follow the main line offered by Xinhua uh, Se. There is no question about that. So it's not the People's Daily, it is the Xinhua Se. That is the key tone that everybody has to follow. But other than that, if it's not the critical political uh, issue uh, involved, then you may do whatever you want. As long as you know, don't step over the boundary line. Uh, for the local media, they would naturally try to get their news source. Take, for example, in my case, I'm not only the commentator for CCTV4, I'm also a commentator for Dongnan Wei Si, for Shenzhen Wei Si, and I'm also a commentator for at least three or four radio stations I write columns for several uh, magazines. Now, how do they approach me? They approach me on their own. And they will negotiate the terms on their own without any uh, directions or involvement from, the, um, from Beijing. And oftentimes, there is, a, there is a very interesting nuance here. The media down in the South are usually much more liberal or liberated vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Beijing media. So when I appear on Shenzhen TV, I can become bolder. I can be more aggressive. But if I appear on Beijing CCTV, I know where the red line is. One example, you don't criticize Ma Yingzhou too much. You criticize Ma Yingzhou, but not that much. So, but you ask me where the line is. This is something that's very subtle. Um, you, can, you can talk about Taiwan's foreign relations, but you don't talk about diplomacy or diplomatic ties. But on Shenzhen's TV, I can talk openly about Taiwan's diplomatic breakthrough. So there, there's this fine difference. Um, Actually, you, if you ask the Taiwan Affairs Office in Beijing, they know exactly what is going on. At one time, the Deputy Director of the Taiwan Affairs Office, who is in charge of monitoring the uh, media, and he said to me, he said, well, you got to let the air out. So we only follow closely, monitor closely the Beijing stations. But as far as uh, the, um, the southern provinces, uh, Fujian or uh, Guangdong is concerned, let them talk whatever they want because they are not as influential as CCTV. Um, it's the, same, the same thing happens with the uh, print media. So this is um, based on what I know, and this is this, this much I can offer. Okay, anybody else? Seems that the, uh, our time is up, is that right? Wow. Okay, so thank you very much for all of the uh, presenters and our discussants. Thank you very much for a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.